Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Susan, and I'm a member of the Al-Anon family groups. This is our first time to be at Founders Day, and what a thrill. Uh, we have had uh, an amazing host, Phil, has taken us all over so that we could see all the important places, and uh, we've had a great time. We got here yesterday, so we've had some extra time. Uh, my home group is the Monday Morning al Group on Marco Island, Florida. And for those of you who don't know where Marco Island is, we're... We're just, uh, we're on the Gulf Coast, kind of across from Miami. And uh, we're on a true island and having a great time down there. Um, I've been recovering in the al family group since March the 17th of 1980. <clears throat> and, and I've been coming longer than the old-timers that were here before. I don't know what that says about me. Um, I have a sponsor. Uh, my sponsor's name is Beverly R., and she lives in Fort Worth, Texas, and she keeps me <laughs> online, I'll tell you. she uh, I call her once a week on Monday afternoons at 3.30. That gives her time for her nap, I think, and to get ready for me. I'm not sure. Um, but she's been my sponsor now for um, just about 25 years. So she's been my sponsor a long time. I'm grateful for that. Um, what I want to tell you, there's a lot of alcoholics in this room, and what I want to tell you is that I love alcoholics. I like sober ones, but I love Alcoholics. And I love Alcoholics Anonymous as well. Um, I need to tell you just a little bit about how I got tangled up with an alcoholic. Um, you, you, You alcoholics, now I'm telling you, you're smooth. You're smooth. Um, we were, Actually, I need to tell you this, too. On June 18th, we will celebrate 53 years of marriage. So I must have been a mere child when we got married. That's not true, though. Um, But anyway, um, we were both going to a little college, a little university in Topeka, Kansas, and that's where we were originally from, was Kansas. And um, I was in a sorority, and I had to take a date. And both of the guys I was had, had been dating me were campus for grades. And so I just said, I can't go. And they said, you're a pledge. You have to go. And I said, fine, get me a date. And he is who they got me. <clears throat> now... Um, he came to pick me up. We, you know, I had one of those little white tutu formals, and he had on his tux, and he brought his ukulele. Oh, my God. And he played Ain't She Sweet. It was all over for me, I tell you. Um, I thought that was the, I mean, I finally, I said, is that the only song you know on the ukulele after we'd been around? And he said, no, I know my brother Bill has a still on the hill. And I should have figured it out, you know. I should have figured it out. And then, and then this was in December, and he went back to his hometown, and he sent me flowers so that my guy that was, that I had been dating that was, was going to to school in Missouri, I, you know, he wanted him to know there was somebody else, but he said, how many roses did I send you? 
And I told, I, he sent me 14. And I had counted them. And I think he decided I was the one for him as well. But anyway, obviously we, we got together and we got, you know, we got married and, um, actually, you know, after we got married, we, we moved back to his little town in southwest Kansas, a little town called Ulysses in Grant County. And it's out in the middle of nowhere, just a little tiny town. And, uh, I mean, after, after we actually moved back, and he, he'd been in the service and I'd been teaching, we moved back. The, the day we got back, and we had to go to a funeral, and then I wanted to go back to Topeka to see my folks, a dirt storm came up. And I, I, I think about those times and I think, you know, we had, the, we had a brand new little house. It was full of dirt. Dirt. And somebody came in and cleaned it for us. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure about alcoholism. I knew nothing about alcoholism, but I did know he t- my husband told me just right a day or two before we got married, he said, you know, my dad's an alcoholic, and I will never be one. And, and I think none of, nobody that's an alcoholic ever decides to be one, and nobody decides to marry an alcoholic as well. And I didn't know, I didn't know that he was an alcoholic. I didn't know, that, all I knew was that we just had a lot of fun. You know, we were having a lot of fun. And uh, we moved back to this little town, and uh, we were supposed to stay for five years to see if we liked it. And on the fourth year, his dad died. And now we had two little kids by then, and um, his mother was a widow, and his brother was still in college, and he had to take over the, the business. And I don't know that that accelerated the alcoholism. All I know was that he kept drinking more and more, and I really didn't know what to do about it. And this is kind of a tough part of our lives during that time because I didn't know what to do. Uh, we, had this, we had this country doc that had delivered both of my babies, our babies, and, uh, and so what I did was I started calling the country doc and and he, you know, he just lived down the street. I had know his number. We had it was a town of five thousand. I mean, or four maybe at that time. And I called him and I'd say he's out drinking again, because he would go out and get drunk and and then come home and we'd have fights and it, it was just awful. And and so I kept calling this doctor every time. And finally, I got him to agree to come to the house to talk to us talk to my husband and see if he, I thought maybe he could straighten him out. <clears throat> he came in and they talked about business and I'm thinking, let's get on with this. And finally, the doctor said to Don, now Susan says you've been drinking a bit too much. And Don said to the doctor, well, of course you know that's not true. And the doctor said, of course I know that's not true. What we're dealing with here is an hysterical mommy. That's exactly what he said. And it, I, I, have you ever seen a movie where they put the heroine up in the attic, there's nothing wrong with her, but they tell her there is, and that's how I felt. That's how I felt. And it was like, it was like a mosquito netting came down over me, and I didn't let you in, and I didn't I didn't want to get out. It was it was a really hard time. Now, you know, I wasn't about to give up. I wasn't about to give up. The drinking was getting worse and worse, and uh, so I de- we're Episcopalians, and I decided I'll have the priest. I'll talk to the priest, and he can help me. So I did, and he said I can cure alcoholism. And I thought, good deal, good deal. Now, I'm going to tell you what what he, the priest and I did, and I want you to know that my husband went along with all of this, all of it. 
This is what we did. Well, what, you know, the priest did, he, he said, first he, he laid hands on Don and prayed over him. He anointed him with oil. Okay. He pr- he, and I tried. I tried doing this too. We prayed over him in tongues. We did all of that. And he even dunked him in the local swimming pool. You know, and I thought a long time that none of that worked. I have a, I have a woman that I sponsor that still lives in Kansas, and she's been in the program about as long as I have, but she was telling one of her friends before she got in the program that her husband, she thought he was drinking too much and he was an alcoholic, and this woman said, I know how to cure alcoholism. And she said, you do? She said, yes. She said, get a chicken and run around the perimeter of your house with a dead chicken. And she thought it didn't work right away because it was a frozen chicken. <laughs> now, you can't tell me that al don't try everything. We, we have laughed because, she and I have laughed because while we thought it didn't work, both of our husbands are sober. I mean, really. So we may know how to cure it. I don't know. What happened, though, was that um, I had my own business, um, and I had a woman who was working for me, um, and I didn't know that she drank too much. I had no idea. She and Don drank a lot alike. I remember that now that I look back on it, but she... On New Year's Eve, she tried to commit suicide in an alcoholic blackout, and and she didn't succeed. And we're grateful for that, because um, she she started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now I I didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous, and so I tried to talk her out of it. I said, you know, you're you you're not an alcoholic, and she said, Susan, I am. And I'm going to those me. I'm going to the meetings. And uh, but she she's the one that 12 stepped my husband. And so I'm really grateful for that. Um, you know, I don't know whether Don was at his end, but I was getting close to mine. And uh, you know, I had I had even tried I tried going to a counselor. Um, I didn't want anybody in that little town to know. So I I went. 250 miles away to a counselor so that people wouldn't... Of course, everybody probably knew because we'd have these arguments and we didn't want the kids to hear them, so we'd go out on the back porch where the neighbors could hear the arguments. <clears throat> things are not going well at our house. And, um, you know, after I'd been in the program for a while, you know, I, I would read about and hear about people that had, you know, that had... had just these awful things, you know, an alcoholic would, and uh, I didn't know how bad the alcoholism was. I really didn't. And uh, my husband told me later that he, I told him, you either get a, go to counseling or I'm putting your clothes on the front porch. That's what I, I don't know whether I'd gone through with it or not. But I went to Wichita by myself, and he went to Wichita by himself. <laughs> and And... He was late for his appointment, and the reason he was late for his appointment was that he he woke up under a parked car in the parking garage, and it wasn't his car. And I see, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I I didn't know that till after he shared that at the meetings. Well, this this woman that used that was working for me took him to his first AA meeting, and. They finally thought that I was not quite as crazy, maybe, and they let me come to some open AA meetings. And um, I think it was probably not real safe, but at the open AA meetings in that little town, uh, there were three of them a week, and there were a lot of couples. And so there were, the al were came to the open meetings as well, and they would come up to me and... Um, 
talk to me and try to hug me. And I got back in the corner. I wasn't going to let anybody touch me. And they kept saying, you know, you, we have Al-Anon just down the hall twice a week. We'd like you to come. And I said, no, thank you. I wasn't about What I really thought Alcoholics Anonymous was going to do is they were going to teach my husband to be a social drinker. And I thought he'd probably go for two or three weeks and be done. You know, I, I didn't know. And... <clears throat> But finally, one night, Don, Don, I, Don was, my husband was going to meetings every night. And if they only had like four meetings or five in that little town a night, which is amazing for that little town. And the other nights, they'd go, they'd go out of town to a meeting, 20, 30 miles away, sometimes more. And he got home really late one night. And I was doing my normal thing. I was, sleeping on his side of the bed. I gave that excuse that there was a phone on that side and the clock, of course, I could, then I knew when he came home. But he came home that night and I said, where have you been? Because it was like midnight. And I, and he said, Susan, you know, I've been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, how long are you going to go to those meetings? And he said, I think the rest of my life. And I thought, oh, my God. We have come to this. You know, I, I just, I didn't understand a bit. But what I did then was I called one of those women that had been coming to Al-Anon and talking to me. This woman really had been 12-stepping me because I was a portrait photographer. And she started coming to my studio. She brought the children. She had the whole family in. She had me take business glossies for her because she was a realtor. Uh, she had me do a passport picture. I don't know that she's ever left the country, actually. <clears throat> and she paid for all those things. But what she was doing was 12-stepping me. I know that's what it was today. And uh, uh, I called her and asked her if she would come and talk to me that next morning. And she came to my house and stayed uh, for hours. I know she did. And what she... I don't know whether any of you have these crystal clear, clear moments, but that was, that was one of the crystal clear moments. And she... Uh, I told her, I said, I've been going to those open meetings. I do not like the steps, because I was mad at God by that time, because God had not gotten him sober. Of course, she pointed out to me when I started telling her all this, you know, Don's been sober for a month. I hadn't thought about that. So I, that, I, that argument I couldn't get, and I said, well, you know, if I have anything to drink, I just, I have one, maybe two drinks, and that's it. Why can't he just do that? Just have one or two. And um, she looked at me, and her hands were kind of shaking. I remember that. And she said, okay, this is the deal. She said, when you've had a couple of drinks, there's a little beeper that goes off in your head, and it goes, beep, 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 beep. You've had enough to drink, and his beeper is broken. <clears throat> And I got it. I got it. And so, you know, I went with her to that, my very first Al-Anon meeting. And um, I don't know what they did. All I know is that I think they had a beginner's meeting. I really do. It was a small group. Um, and she took me and kept taking me until uh, I could take myself. And... Uh, I, I've never quit coming back. I just never have quit coming back. I just loved it from the first meeting that I went to. You know, I, it was one thing for me to come to open meetings and hear the alcoholic's point of view, but when I could hear it from the Al-Anon members, what a thrill that was. And um, I asked that woman to be my sponsor. 
She has since quit going to meetings. She divorced her husband and, and has remarried. But she and I talk. I always call her on my Al-Anon birthday. Um, and we've really made a, a new connection with each other. Even though she doesn't go to meetings, we're, we still really love each other. And she did so much to help me. She's the one that took me through the steps for the first time. Um, I'd never been to a conference and there was a little, here I came in in March, and in the first for a weekend in May, there was a little conference down on the Paladora Canyon of Texas. And somebody said, well, we have a Winnebago, and let's, a bunch of us just go down there, we're, we'll go down there. And, uh, and so I, I went to get on the Winnebago, and I had this box. And, uh, they said, um, What's in the box, Susan? Because I had my suitcase in this box. And I said, games. They said, why are you bringing games? And I said, well, what are you going to do down there? Somebody has to entertain them, you know. And I remember writing down there, um, somebody, I heard somebody say, and I still can hear it, let's play a game with her to shut her up. <clears throat> I heard my first Al-Anon speaker there, uh, Karen A. from Laguna. Um, I just got to see her just a few weeks ago and have lunch with her because I was out in California. And um, she got up and she said, if you alcoholics, she, I mean, I can't believe this. She said, you alcoholics, if you think you have a lot of problems with all your defects of character, think what it would be like to come into this program perfect. And I got it, you know. My, my, this new little sponsor that I had took me off on a little walking trail and, uh, she said, I mean, I had, I mean, I hadn't been in Allen very long. She said, it's time for you to write your in, your inventory. They didn't mess around with me. They, they thought I wouldn't stay, I think. And maybe that's how they did it with everybody. But I said, you know, I don't believe I want to do that. And, <laughs> I don't know what your sponsors did when you said that. She said, fine. She said, then you'll have to get another sponsor if you won't write an inventory. And I didn't want another sponsor. <clears throat> She'd been working with me and helping me and making me feel better. And um, so I did. I did my first inventory with her. And I, I try to write an inventory about once a year. But I just kept going to the meetings, and and my husband w was going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and and it was a whole new way of life for us, and it certainly was a whole new way of life for me. Um, sometime around there, uh, my dad had a terrible stroke, and uh, we ended up moving him back to that little town, and. Uh, I, I had been real angry with my dad, and uh, I'd written a lot about my dad. And um, I would go see him in the care home, and he was kind of all shriveled up, kind of in a fetal position. And I would stand there, and I would look at him, and I would think to myself, you deserve this. I'd think of that about my dad. and But then I would weep. And I must have shared that at a meeting, and, and somebody at the meeting came up to me afterwards, it wasn't my sponsor, and said, I had a similar thing happen, perhaps I can help you. And I ended up writing an inventory about my dad. And she told me what to do. What, she, what we found out when I wrote the inventory was all the good things my dad had done for me. We never went hungry. He... he he taught me to love literature. He taught me to love music. When we lived in Wichita, Kansas, I helped start the Wichita Grand Opera. I never would have known to do things like that. And, but my dad taught me that. And so she said, go to the care home, and I want you to wash his face and his hands and rub lotion on him, and I want you to make amends for your part. Because I would, he would call me when he was well, and he would say, Susie, Susie, why won't you talk to me? But I was so angry with him. Um, the, the truth is that 
because of that, um, I could make the amends to my dad. And he died not very long after that, but I was free. I was free. Um, you know, you don't go through this life without having some difficulties. And, and um, our son suffered from the disease of alcoholism. And, um, but he was a functioning alcoholic like his daddy. And uh, he, uh, <clears throat> uh, he graduated college, got married, and, and went to medical school and graduated as a physician and um, had been accepted. He'd gone to Duke to do his residency. He graduated toward the end of May, 1st of June, and he was dead by August, the last of August. Um, he died, he really, he died of a drug overdose. <clears throat> he wasn't dead when we went, when we went down to, to uh, Durham, North Carolina, but he was brain dead. And we had to hold him while the lines went flat and let him go. Boy, that was a tough deal. That was a tough deal. They had a little boy, uh, Sam, and Sam was two. Sam um, is graduating from college this next weekend. And uh, he's 22, and we get to be a part of his life. We're a part of his, our son's wife's life. What a deal. I don't, you know, she could have said, I'm done with you. Uh, we could have not participated in anything, but she's been like a daughter to us, and what a great thing. Our daughter, we have a daughter, and uh, <clears throat> she and her husband live in Washington, D.C., and uh, she's an attorney, and her husband uh, works for American University, and they have a little boy and a little girl, a little girl seven and a little boy ten, and we're just blessed. The third week of this month, we go to D.C. Um, our daughter converted to Judaism about after she and her husband had been married about ten years, and... Um, <clears throat> She married a Jewish man, and her and her the her husband's family, and her his mother and father and Don and I got to take them down the aisle and stand under the chuppah when they got married, and we married his parents. You know, could we do this outside the program? I don't know. Maybe we could. Maybe we could, but all I know is that when I say I love alcoholics, you know, I, I do. And it's because there's so, so much variety and interest in life, just so much. And um, all these things that have happened, you know, with, 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 with that. You know, I could be really angry that I married an alcoholic. I, I'm not. I'm thrilled. I would never have had this life. Um, I was able to to make amends to my dad and to forgive my dad. I've, I've been able to forgive our son. You know, I, I don't remember that I ever had to forgive Don for being an alcoholic, but what I want to say, and somebody reminded me of this, I, sometimes I forget to say this, that true forgiveness is remembrance without pain. I, all I know is that I, you, you don't forget, but you don't have to be in pain anymore if you are, are in the process of doing the steps and the traditions and going to the meetings. Um, Don and I have a great life. We just moved to this little island in Florida uh, just about a year ago, and uh, we're having a great time going to meetings, getting to come to things like this. And uh, I think it's Don's turn to talk now, so I'm going to let him tell his story. He, he really doesn't want me to follow him because I might correct him, you know. 
<laughs> Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. My name is Don. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> By God's grace, sponsorship, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been sober since February the 21st of 1980, and I'm so grateful for my sobriety. <laughs> my home group is... Uh, the Three Legacies Group in Naples, Florida. We, we live uh, in Marco Island, as Susan said, and I regularly attend meetings at the Primary Purpose Group in Marco Island, Florida. There are people from both of those groups in the audience here tonight. Uh, I'm so grateful to the Akron Al-Anon Intergroup for inviting Susan and I to come speak this weekend. As Susan said, we've, we've been in our programs 33 and a half years. It's the first time we've come to Founders Day. And this was a bucket list experience for this lady and me. And so thank you for that. Thank you for, for all the kindness that you have shown us this weekend. <laughs> Phil has been a marvelous host. He's taken us to all the, all the places that we need to go in this cradle of AA history. And uh, I, if I talk too much about that, I'll get too emotional to tell you a little bit of my story. So I'm just going to have to say how meaningful that's been to us this week. I want to thank the three, the three guys, Bob, Bill, and Sterling, for a marvelous start-up for this convention a while ago. Thank you, guys. And I want to thank Susan for her Al-Anon story. I tell you truly, Susan is one of my most favorite Al-Anon speakers, and I mean that, and, I, and partly I'm trying to suck up to her, but I really kind of mean that, too. <laughs> and i got to be honest, every time I hear her story, and I love to hear her talk, I can't help but think, my God, how boring her story would be were it not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was 41 years old when I, I started to say when I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was 41 years old when I was shoved into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous by that friend of Susan's who 12-stepped me. And from the vantage point of being sober for 33 and a half years and looking back in retrospect, I look back at my life, I can see that if there's one thing that I would tell you that describe what I used to be like, it would be this. And what I used to be like is that something was missing. Something was just always missing. I look at back at my life and it, it's clear to me that 41 years of my life were a sometimes frantic and always futile search for that indefinable something that was going to make me whole. It was like if I tried to put together the picture puzzle of my life, there was always this missing piece right in the middle of me. And, and, and I, there were times when I think that I, I think I'd found what was missing. I remember when between my sophomore and junior year in high school, I'd talk my dad into letting me take flying lessons and I got to fly an airplane by myself for the first time. I thought, God, I can't get better than this. And, and then one of the junior girls asked me to go to the junior senior prom and Two o'clock in the morning on a dust, dirty, dusty road in rural Grant County, Kansas, I was absolutely certain that I'd found the missing piece in the picture puzzle of my life, no pun intended. But really, the, the piece de resistance came later that summer when I talked my dad into buying, into, into borrowing his 54 Ford Coupe and taking three of my buddies to the drive-in theater. And we got out there, and one of those guys had a pint of vodka. Now, I, Susan mentioned that I told her that my dad was an alcoholic, and I know that we say that we have to say we're... I'm the only one that can say I'm an alcoholic, but I tell you what, if my dad wasn't an alcoholic, there never was one. 
And I grew up in a home that knew all the heartache and the heartbreak and the broken promises and the grief and the fights and the feuds and the fusses of active alcoholism. And I promised myself I wouldn't ever drink. But when that kid passed that bottle around, without one thought, I took the biggest swallow of that tequila that I could get down. And I thought I was going to die for about 30 seconds. And, and it burned and it scalded my throat and it and then it hit down in my belly and things started to change. And I really, I, I say this and I mean it. I, I think my career as a social drinker lasted just however long it took that bottle to get back around to me. Because the only thought I had was I hope to God there's some of that stuff left when it makes the next trip around. And that's all I remember about that night. I mean, looking back at my, at my drinking history, not a lot changed in the next 20, 24 years. They really didn't. I drank till I run out, blacked out, or passed out. That's just the way I drink. And, and I'd get in a lot of trouble with my drinking. I ended up wrecking my dad's car that night. I had to cook up a big bunch of lies to get out of trouble. And that's just what happened to me the rest of my life. Now, I'd try all kinds of crazy things to replace the, to, to try to fill the void in my life. I know when I was in my early 30s in the 1970s, one morning I was shaving and I looked in the mirror and I thought, my God, I've just figured out what's missing in my life. It's called hair. I mean, I, I, I've been this bald headed since I was in my mid 20s and I thought, that's what's wrong with me. I'm prematurely bald headed. That, that, to get some hair to fix it. So I made some inquiries and I found this Dr. Brown in Wichita, Kansas. I got my little airplane and flew down there 250 miles. Parked in front of a liquor store. I thought, that's handy. And uh, climbed up. The, his office was upstairs over the liquor store. I climbed up there. And he explained to me that for $5,000, he could cut 50 plugs of hair out of the back of my neck. And he could take five rows with 10 plugs each and make rows of hair in the top of my head. And if we got lucky, grow me 10 corn rows of hair. And he said, what do you think about that? And I said, not much. And he said, why? And I said, look. Five, this was in the 70s. I said, $5,000 is a heck of a lot of money. But the real reason is that you're as bald-headed as I am. If this works so good, why don't you do it to yourself? And he said, it doesn't bother me to be bald-headed. And I said, it didn't bother me this much either. Thanks. And I paid him my $50 consultation fee and left. And I walked down to my car, and I went into the liquor store and bought a fifth of Jester Greeny and Brooks Magic Elixir, my favorite brand. And I started to get in my car. I did get in my car, and I looked at, as I was starting the car. I just looked out the windshield, and next door to the liquor store was a barber shop. And I'm looking in the windows of the barber shop, and I could tell it was kind of a different kind of barber shop than we had in Ulysses, Kansas. This guy had about ten styrofoam models of men's heads sitting there in the window, and on each men's head was a full head of hair. He was selling them. Hair pieces. An easier, softer way just jumped right up and grabbed me. I walked in there and gave him 300 bucks, and I walked out an hour later looking just like one of my heroes, a country and western singer named Glenn Campbell. <laughs> had a full head of hair, had a pompadour. Man, I was hip slick and cool. And the only, there was this challenging condition they had to figure out how to you know you got the shiny ball head and you got the rug and you got to figure out a way to stick the rug on top of the shiny ball head so it's a long time ago they probably figured out a better way but what they did they sold me a roll of double-sided adhesive tape and they had me <laughs> cut this adhesive tape into little one inch strips and I'd peel the backing off of one side and stick that in the inside perimeter of the wig and then I got that stuck down all the way around. I'd peel the other, the other side off. Now I got a sticky side down, a sticky side up, and stick it on my head and comb it in and hit it with some hairspray. And I'm ready to go do the boogaloo. I mean, that's it. Someone told me before the meeting that they would heard me talk one time. It's the only time he's ever heard anybody use the phrase boogaloo. But that's what we did in the places where I like to go, I'll tell you for sure. So I walked out of there with my new hair stuck to my head with a double-sided adhesive tape, and I headed to the, a joint down on South Seneca Street. 
And I started drinking and listening to the country and western band play that lonesome blues. And, and then I started dancing. See, when I drink, I become, if not the best, one of the best dancers in the state of Kansas. <laughs> and I'm, uh, my, my conversational skills escalate beyond all means of I could do otherwise. And, and, and so I'm dancing and, and drinking my scotch and, and some real predictable things are going to happen. You know, that stuff goes down in my belly and my whole perception and outlook on life change. And then about a half hour later, there's another predictable thing that happen. It's, it makes my head sweat. <laughs> scotch comes out the top of my head in the form of perspiration. Now, adhesive tape does not like perspiration. So I'm out here dancing and my head starts sweating from the scotch and my, and the tape starts losing its stickiness and comes loose and the rug turns around sideways on the top of my head. And all of a sudden the part on my hair is running from ear to ear, you know. That pompadour that I was so proud of is hanging down over my right earlobe. And no one was impressed. I, trust me. I wrestled around with that wig for a couple of years, I think, and I was in the asphalt paving business. I'd taken a job rebuilding an airport at Alamosa, Colorado, and strange things would happen. It wouldn't always all come loose at once. Sometimes just one side would come loose and it'd, it'd flip over and you'd have a kind of a cool half scalp look, you know. I can tell you that doesn't impress them either. Uh, I'd made it back to my motel in Alamosa that night, and I think all of a sudden it was time for me to make my evening oblations before the throne of American Standard. And I went in and kneeled down in front of the throne and put my head down, and there was one old lonesome piece of tape still holding on to that wig. And when that stuff came up, that tape gave out, and it all fell in there together. And it was ugly, I mean to tell you. And I didn't fish it out. I just hit the silver handle, and that was the end of my wig story. <laughs> and, I, and I went back to the only thing that really ever worked to make me feel like I was halfway comfortable in what was basically an alien and inhospitable world, and that was booze. I don't think my drinking, my alcoholism, the progression of my alcoholism was a moral affliction, but but I lost all sense of my moral compass in the, in the progress of my alcoholism. I became a liar and a cheat and a thief in every area of my life. I adopted a credo of living that essentially said whatever means I need to take to get what I think I need to fill that missing piece in the hole in my belly, any means justifies the end. And if I thought I needed more love in my life, I went about the business of doing that, and I brought the fatal affliction of infidelity into our marriage. And if I thought I needed more money, and I could get more money by breaking some laws and rules of the way I'm supposed to do business, I didn't hesitate to do that. So in February of 1980, that's what my life was like. I was a absentee father, a part-time husband, and I was spending so much time drinking, it's a miracle that I was still in business at all. Susan said that we, we went to this, see this marriage counselor together, and I think one day he asked me if my drinking caused trouble at home, and that was too tough for me to answer. So I kind of twisted it around, and I thought he, I, I, I paraphrased it in my mind to say that he said, well, why do you drink at home? And I thought that's a hell of a good question, and I, I got a, a business started in Denver so I could run away to Denver and drink. And that was what was going on on February the 20th of 1980. I was going out to get in my airplane and fly to Denver and spend three days doing what I do in Denver. And Susan called just as I was walking out the office door and said, Joyce and I want to go to Denver with you. The last two people in my life I wanted to go to Denver with me. It's obvious why I didn't want Susan to go because of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. kind of, kind of life that I was living. And she told you about Joyce, who had been kind of fun to be around with and drink with before, but she tried to kill herself and got drunk and passed out, blacked out or something, and then she started going to this stupid outfit called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, she was, I didn't want her to go either. I thought, how boring can this be? But I guess I should have known that the end was near, because I said, okay, 
I'll meet you at the airport. And they came right out, and we jumped in the airplane and flew to Denver. And I went to the bar in the Holiday Inn where I kept a room rented, and they went to do whatever they came to do, and that's the last thing I remember about February the 20th of 1980. I came to the morning of the 21st. I knew I was in big trouble because Susan was in the room. Uh, I got up, put on my pants and the dirty shirt from the night before. Susan had ordered some coffee. We were sitting in the room. I was trying to drink coffee, but I was shaking too bad. I was pouring it down the front of my shirt. And I guess she'd call Joyce and ask her to come for coffee because there was a knock on the door. And so I was actually, I opened the door and Joyce came leaping and bounding into the room with her bright, clear little AA eyes and said, good morning, Donald, how are you? And I said, Joyce, I'm not worth a damn. And she looked at me, there used to be a speaker, Larry heard him a lot of times, I know, called Wino Joe Leith from Tyler, Texas. And Wino Joe used to say the five little magic words of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know how you feel. I know how you feel. And that's what she said. I know how you feel. And it started snowing and we couldn't go home. And Joyce started talking to me about her drinking and her new experience with Alcoholics Anonymous. I stood in that gatehouse today, and I looked at that little room with those chairs sitting there, and I thought about Bill and Dr. Bob talking for five hours. And when it was over, Bill said, for the first time in my, or Bob said, for the first time in my life, I had talked to someone that really understood. And 45 years later, in a hotel room in South Colorado Boulevard in Denver, Colorado, the same thing happened to this alcoholic. She didn't know how I felt. And when we finished talking, I knew that she knew and that she understood. And she was sober five weeks, five weeks. So if you're new here today, don't think you can't carry the message to Alcoholics Anonymous to another alcohol. She came by and picked me up that night when we got home. It was cold. I was trying to get back in the big bed, so I was in the kitchen doing the dishes, something I rarely did. Doorbell ring. I'm standing there in my shirt sleeves. It's about 10 below. We had real winters in the high plains of southwestern Kansas, like they do in Nebraska, where Sterling's from. And uh, I opened the door, and Joyce was standing there in the park, and she's a pretty big corn fed girl. And I said, Joyce, come in. You're going to freeze to death. She said, no, let's go. And I said, go where? And she said, you promised me in that hotel room you'd come with me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, yeah, by God, I didn't mean tonight. <laughs> and she grabbed me right by the collar of my shirt, no coat, and drug me out and through the door of her car. But she said, get your fanny in the car. We're going to AA. And I've been coming back ever since, I'll tell you. That's this guy to be my sponsor. He took me through the 12 steps. He, uh, I was like Susan. When he says it's time to write your fourth step, I carefully explained to him that my construction season was beginning and I would have to postpone that for about a year. He showed up in my office the next day and he dropped a big chief yellow notebook tablet on my desk and two number two pencils. And I said, what's this for? And he said, write till you run out of paper, run out of pencil, Ed, and I'll see you in my house Thursday night. And he took me through the fifth, through the eighth step of Alcoholics Anonymous. When we finished step seven, we got up off our knees from staying the seven-step prayer. He said, Don, take out another sheet of paper. And I said, no, I can't do this one, Louie. I had read ahead, even though he had told me not to. <laughs> he said, we're just going to make the list. I said, I can't do it. It's too much. I can't ever clean it up. And I was lying to him. His sponsor was a guy named Jerry who became my sponsor for 18 years after Louie moved away when I was five years sober. Jerry used to say, if you're a drunken horse thief and you decide you need to do something about your drinking, you're probably also going to have to quit stealing horses. 
And the truth was, I didn't know if I wanted to quit stealing the horses in my life. But anyway, we went through my inventory. We made the list. It was long. I folded it up, put it in my billfold like he told me to do, and, and went home and wrote a letter about, of resignation to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what I did. <laughs> and the next weekend at a little conference down in the, pan, uh, the panhandle of Texas in the Paladura Canyon, a guy who I've known all my life, who's sober three years longer than I am, named Bernie, came up to me in that little AA conference and made an amend over something I didn't know anything about that he had done to harm me. And I said, Bernie, I don't want your money. And he said, you don't get it. He said, I'm afraid if I don't do this, I'm going to get drunk. And the light came on in my thick head, and I thought, this is why you do this, not to be good boys and girls. You clean house for one reason, to stay sober, to stay sober. Susan shared with you about how long she's been a member of Al-Anon. And I'm so grateful to Al-Anon. Grateful tonight to Al-Anon for even be standing here. I'm standing here because of Al-Anon. But my sobriety is not dependent upon Susan being a member of Al-Anon. The big book tells me, and I believe it without any mental reservation, that job or no job, wife or no wife, my sobriety isn't contingent upon another human being. It's contingent upon me cleaning house and trusting God and letting God into my life with a box of tools that can fix what's wrong with this grump. But here's the corollary to that truth. My life, my sobriety, my sober life is so greatly enhanced because she's a member, an active member of Al-Anon and has been that way for this many years. She told you. She told you about our son and, and, and his drug overdose. We, we, we've had to deal with things. We all have these things come up in our lives, whether we're sober or we're still out there practicing. But because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the Al-Anon family groups, we've been given the tools and the love and the fellowship and the people around us to help us deal with these things. I grieved in rage for years over Stevens dying because I, I kept trying to play God with this thing. I kept trying to say, why? I'd go to conferences like this, and I'd see young, sober men, and I'd think, why can they get sober and not our son, Steve? And a giant of a man who died sober, his name was Ed Mutum, helped me one night at a retreat down in Norman, Oklahoma, understand what I had to do. I, I had to... Quit dabbling in God's. It's God. Why? It's not Don's business. Why? It's God's business. And from that point on, I was really able to not be immersed and obsessed with the why thing. And then a few years later, I was doing what I'm doing tonight at the Doctors and Alcoholics Anonymous convention in Minneapolis. And after I talked to people, came by the doctors, the nurses, the medical techs, all those prof medical professions, and Thank me for talking. But there were three people standing over here in their 40s, a man and two men and a woman. And they came up and they said, we want you to know something. We were in Stephen's caduceus group. They were all members of, 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 of the, the uh, impaired physicians program. And she said, we used to have to go to those meetings and we'd laugh when we got out of those meetings and say, we're too smart to ever get in trouble with drugs or alcohol. And she said, what we want you to know tonight is that we think we're here and alive because Stephen died. And what I learned that night is, you know, in God's world, in God's world, I don't think things do happen by accident. In God's world, not in man's world. All kinds of bad things happen in, in, in man's world. But in God's world, I think there can be a purpose and a higher reason for the seeming tragedies that take place in our life. And I think there was some purpose and AA goodness in what happened to Stephen. I told you I brought the fatal affliction of infidelity into our marriage. And my sponsor told me from the night I wrote that first, fourth, fifth, I read that first inventory to him in step five that I had to make a decision. There's no longer any ghosts in our bedroom. 
but it was bad in our house because of my infidelity. And he said, you've got to decide if you want a new marriage or not. He said, you've screwed up the old one. It's dead. And he said, you've got to start now and stop doing what you're doing and start doing different things. And I did that. And I made amends to Susan. I made amends to the kids. And I made amends to the graveside to my dad and to my mother who was still living and my brother and the people that I had stolen and cheated from. But things didn't immediately get better. There were still ghosts in our bedroom. And I asked Louie one time, I said, Louie, how long is it going to be before she can trust me? And he said, I don't know. It'll be sometime after you've shown her you're trustworthy. You know, really all you've ever asked me to do is grow up, act like an adult, and be responsible for my own behavior. That's all you've really ever asked me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And she, working with her sponsor and, her, and doing her steps, got to that point that she talked about in her story tonight, when she could, she could remember my infidelity without pain. And, and forgiveness came. And we have a, the great miracle of my life is my sobriety, but like unto it is my relationship with this woman. We, uh, I told you that I had some, I broke some laws in my business. And my sponsor was taking me, you know, through these amend steps and he said, when are you going to deal with this thing? It was called bid rigging. I was involved in, 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 in I was a contractor and I was involved in some illegal bidding practices. And I, I would say something to him like, well, you know, like, you can't rig a bid by yourself, and it says except when to do so would injure them or others, and he'd get very aggravated with me and say, what does the big book say to do? And I'd say, well, something about praying for the willingness until it comes. And I was, he said, then you better start praying. you got to clean this deal up. I never rigged a bid from the night I took my first fifth, fifth step. But he said, that's part one of the amends process. Stop doing the deal. And step two is right the wrong. You've got to right the wrong. It's not a I'm sorry situation. It's what can I do to right the wrong. But I was doing some praying by this in my journey through sobriety, and some mornings I'd get up and thank God, ask for his help to stay sober today, and say, oh, and by the way, if it isn't too much problem, you might show me how to clean up this bid reading deal. Amen. And... Uh, I tell you, you need to be careful what you pray for, no matter how insincerely you pray for it. When I was about a year and a month sober, Uncle Sam, I guess God thought I was a little slow on ninth step in this area, and he sent the Justice Department of Uncle Sam to help me accelerate the process. And I ended up pleading guilty to one count of violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and one count of mail fraud because the check came in the mail. And... Uh, the judge, uh, I don't know why they still do this in the federal system, but the judge sent us home to do a pre-sentence investigation. And people like my sponsor and my sponsor's sponsor and a lot of people in AA wrote letters to the judge and said he quit rigging bids when he did his fifth step. But what Susan and I did for about three or four weeks is we started watching old movies on late night TV about life in hard time prisons. It's not recommended. Uh, we each developed a bad fear phobia, really. She was afraid they were going to shoot me, and I was afraid they were going to do something else to me. Uh, one night, I was over at my friend's house, and you need a good AA buddy in times like this. And uh, I was crying to him about how I, I was going to prison, and he said, oh, my God. He said, you'll probably only get six months or so. He said, you can do that standing on your head. He was an ex-dope dealer, and he didn't think my crimes were... Hardly worthy of mention. And uh, I said, you don't understand, Kenneth. And he said, what is it I'm not supposed to understand? I said, you don't understand what they're going to do to me. And he said, what are they going to do to you? And I said, oh, God, Kenny, they're going to rape me. And he just broke in hysterical laughter and started rolling on the floor. And I'm jumping up and down and telling him what a lousy friend he is. I just spill my guts about my biggest fear to him. He wipes the tears of laughter out of his eyes, and he looks at me, and he says, Don Popejoy? Your ego knows no bounds. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I didn't get it then, and I don't totally get it now. 
And I said, what do you mean, Kenny? And he said, oh, for God's sakes, look at yourself. He said, you're middle-aged, ball-headed, and pot-bellied. He said, baby, you ain't got what they want. <laughs> and he was right. And, you know, uh, we were bankrupt when that deal was over, but they finally let me go back to work and start bidding jobs again. And, and by suiting up and showing up and practicing AA principles in my business life one day at a time, uh, I got all the, all the money paid back. That, that was part of the deal. I had to make restitution. We sold that to, thank you. We, it, we, we don't make our amends so that they can be accepted. We make amends so we can clean, I, I make my amends so I can clean my house from my side of the street and stay sober. But it's, it is, it's really good when your amends are accepted. The day before we moved to Florida, I stood in, on a stage like this. You know, I lied and cheated and stole from the state of Kansas. And I stood on a stage like this, and the Secretary of Transportation of the state of Kansas and the Chief Highway Engineer gave me a plaque commemorating my career and what I had done to improve transportation problems in the state. And I thought, you can't get from the gates of Montgomery Prison to this stage, even in the 26 years that it had been in between those two events at that time. But uh, you can. You can, by God's grace, and sponsorship, and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You have, a, you have let this woman and I stand together on a pair of railroad tracks. And she's on her track working the 12 steps and doing the Al-Anon program. And we're reaching out and holding each other's hands, and I'm standing on that other track, suiting up and showing up for Alcoholics Anonymous and working the 12 steps. And we're walking down those tracks together. My sponsor told me this that night. I read him that first fifth step. And he said, look up. Because he said, when you look up, the tracks come together. That's my understanding of what happy destiny is. She and I, because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the Al-Anon family groups, are still walking down those same tracks that we started walking down 33 half years ago. We're just a lot closer to that glorious day of happy destiny by, by God's grace. Thank you for having us. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.